Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to the third part of the longevity code, the most important codes or hacks on health, energy, performance, psychology and success. It's been a while since we last streamed a part of the longevity code, the second part. This is due to the fact that during lockdown there was no way I could go and get my hair cut and our cameraman could have been in the audience of Woodstock and we had no way of producing another online stream. Now the day before yesterday we've been able to overcome this challenge now that the hairdressers are open again. So today we are going to talk about vitamin D3 and its cofactors which I call the fantastic four and more. I think if there is such a thing as the most extraordinary substance on this planet, with an extremely wide spectrum of efficacy, it has to be vitamin D3. And quite logically so, because vitamin D3 is the sunshine vitamin produced by exposure to the sun. And without the sun, without sunlight, there would be no life on this planet at all. And this vitamin D3 then in our body becomes one of the most important hormones as we're going to see. So this is an extremely interesting topic, particularly in times of Corona. As we are going to see, intensive research is going on worldwide to establish whether or not there is a link between vitamin D3 and the risk of falling ill with coronavirus. So let's get started with the main topic, the Fantastic Four and biological dentistry. As we saw in the interviews that we had in March and April with some of the most highly renowned experts, you can find them all on our YouTube channel, such as Professor Hollick, the person who discovered calcidiol and calcitriol, vitamin D3, to put a name to it, but also Professor Yehuda Schoenfeld, one of the best allergologists worldwide, and others, Professor Cheng, for example, who was extremely successful in uh, with his vitamin D3 treatment in Shanghai in connection with COVID-19. And we can see that they all focus intensively on vitamin D3. So this is a very interesting topic that we are going to discuss today. We start with vitamin D3. And here's how it works. You can see the chart to the left. Vitamin D3 can be formed on our skin as a result of sunshine exposure. In connection with heat, we can see UVB radiation. We'll come back to this. And then vitamin D3 will be formed, which we also supplement from outside. There's also vitamin D2, that's ergocalciferol, derived from plants which we ingest through um, plant food and on the third level we can see that it all develop, develops to form a bioactive hormone calcitriol identified by Professor Hollick from Boston. Now as we are going to see this substance will regulate a large variety of genes in our body. So 80% of vitamin D3 is taken up um, by the skin as a result of sunlight but only as of an angle of insulation of 45 degrees. We need UVB rays and UVB rays only get through the ozone layer, layer partially or fully if the angle of insulation of the sunlight is 45 degrees or more. We also know that as of 45 degrees and more within one hour of exposure to full sunlight over lunch, for example, we can take up 10,000 international units. Just keep this value in mind and make up your own mind as to what you think is reasonable for a human being to take up in terms of vitamin D3. How many international units do you think is appropriate? Always looking at nature and that's the, at the basis of everything we do. We always take nature as an example. It's got to be biological but we also need scientific evidence to support our findings. 
to support our principles. So let's assume we have a healthy human being living naturally, for example in Africa, on the hunt, gathering. It's quite obvious that such a human being will be exposed for several hours, not just minutes, to full sunlight. Let's now take a look at the different types of radiation. There's UVA rays, which you probably know from suntan lotions, because on the packaging it always says contains UVA screens, sunscreens, or UVB sunscreens. UVA is long wave radiation, which penetrates deeply into the skin and causes aging of the skin and can also cause skin cancer. This is the type of radiation which occurs in the morning and in the evening. It doesn't make much sense to get out into the sunlight early in the morning or in the evening just because you think the sunlight is milder. Quite the opposite is true because UVA radiation is more dangerous. Just think of yourselves. If you choose to go out in the sun in the morning, let's say at 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock in, e in the morning or at 5 or 6 in the evening to get some mild sunlight in inverted commas, you will find that your skin will be more stressed, will feel more stressed than if you were to expose yourself to full sunlight over lunch. Of course, always make sure you don't get sunburned. You've got to make your calculations there in order not to get sunburned. And we also sweat substantially more when exposed to full sunlight. But our skin doesn't feel as good if we expose the skin to early morning or evening sunlight. Now, UV radiation tans the skin but does not stimulate the skin to develop natural protection. So what we need to do is stay away from UVA because it doesn't cause the thickening of the outermost layer of the skin, which we need. With UVB, provitamin D3 is produced. UVB is shortwave radiation, which can only get through the ozone layer as of 45 degrees angle of insulation and can then hit our skin and produce the thickening of the outermost layer of the skin, which we cannot see, but which also provides protection against radiation. So UVB produces protection, UVA doesn't, it only tans the skin, but doesn't produce the thickening of the skin. Only UVB produces vitamin D3, as of 45 degrees, and you will know from the past that people were sent to higher altitudes to get cured in case of tuberculosis, neurodermatitis, um, psoriasis, etc. These patients were sent to higher altitudes at clinics where they were exposed to um, the sun. The higher up we go in terms of altitude, the thinner the air becomes and the less UVB rays are filtered out. And we can also benefit from sunlight in early spring or late autumn. Take up vitamin D. So it really does make a difference whether we expose ourselves to the sunlight in at Lake Constance or even worse in Hamburg. Or if you go to high altitudes in uh, St. Moritz in uh, the Swiss mountains, for example, because there you can properly fill up with vitamin D3. This is a therapy that was developed a long time ago and was almost forgotten. And then there's also UVC, that's an ultra short wave uh, radiation, which is almost completely blocked by the ozone layer. It would be very aggressive if it were to come through and wouldn't be good for our health and our skin. Let's now take a look at whether or not we have taken up enough vitamin D3. Take a look at these photographs and you can see that the shadows are clearly longer than um, body length. So we clearly have an angle of insulation below 45 degrees and we know that we need 45 degrees or more. So your shadow has to be shorter than your actual height. Then you're going to take up vitamin D3 and there's a website that I can recommend to you. Um, this is it. This is the second, 22nd of March. 
and to the bottom left you can actually see the angle this is around lunchtime 44 degrees maximum so this was the day before you can actually start taking up vitamin D3 obviously we can also take up some vitamin D3 at lower at smaller angles but it really just starts at 45 degrees so this was the case on the 22nd 23rd of March 2020 around Lake Constance uh, and Zurich now the question is of course why is it that human beings do not get a sufficient amount of vitamin D3 throughout the year why does it only start on the 23rd of March uh, and ends sometime after September well the answer is simple it wasn't nature's plan for human beings to disperse um, further away from the equator and this study here provides the evidence mankind emerged in Africa and with fire weapons and the development of clothes humans started to move further away from the equator where you were able to survive almost naked just by gathering fruits living in a cave around the equator this was no problem but with clothing fire and weapons it was possible for human beings to move further away from the equator south africa argentina etc to the south and and more northern countries uh, to the north but it comes at a certain price i would even go as far as to say at a very high price because we no longer have the high exposure to sunlight uh, as we were used to this is a vicious circle not only have we moved further away from the equator not only is the angle of insulation smaller we also expose our skin much less to the sun and that is of course a crucial factor we do have most the highest density of receptors uh, in the skin and the lower arm but our skin covers one and a half to two square meters uh, depending on how tall you are and but that's quite different from exposing ourselves to the sun in swimming trunks or a bikini take a look at cyclists for example they are almost completely covered up they look like martians and all you can see peeping out is just the tip of the nose just a small patch of skin really compared to what we did um, centuries and millennia ago. This is a slide by Professor Schoenfeld. I took this photograph at one of his uh, conferences and I'm using it here. We interviewed him sometime in March. I really recommend you watch this video on our YouTube channel. What we can see here is that the intensity of UV is clearly highest in Africa where mankind was born take a look at vitamin D levels worldwide and you can see exactly the same pattern again in Africa we clearly have the highest vitamin D levels worldwide this is where um, humans were born the cradle of mankind where we should be living actually now compare this to the incidence of diabetes for example this is what we get the further we move to the north or to the south we can see clearly a higher incidence of diabetes where we have lower vitamin d3 levels we also see a higher incidence of multiple sclerosis this is basically true for all chronic diseases the closer we get to the equator the lower the incidence of these of such cases that's a very interesting phenomenon i believe there is quite a controversy about what vitamin D3 values should be measured and should be looked at. 25-OH vitamin calcidiol, which was also detected and described by Professor Hollick. Let's take a look at these um, uh, charts here, produced by the Robert Koch Institute. Take a look at the levels measured here and the way um, they dis are distributed throughout the general population. Children up to the second year of age have fairly high levels because during pregnancy and the early years um, there is 
vitamin D3 supplementation to prevent rickets. And if babies are breastfed, obviously they benefit from this. But prevention stops after two years. And then the children immediately go down into a deficient state. Take a look at the number up there, 20 nanograms. You've got to be careful about the figures here. Sometimes you can see nanomole um, as a unit, but you've got to divide that number by two and a half. We prefer to talk about nanograms. This is the value and the, the unit most um, sources worldwide refer to. So we can see here with children and adolescents how many actually are below 20 nanograms. Even if you apply the orthodox view of traditional medicine it's clearly insufficient it should be at least 30 nanograms that's the official statement and we can see uh, that below 20 nanograms that's the immunological hibernation mode we have almost 50 percent of children there and the situation is even worse with adults because they spend even less time in fresh air but let's take a look at the animal kingdom there are similar studies where different types of monkeys were examined to identify their vitamin D3 levels because they are very similar to human beings and we can see here that they show values of 395, 155, 165 nanograms very very high values indeed we, which we do not recommend for human beings but we can see that in the animal kingdom animals that are very similar to human beings show very high values this is uh, information from the DGE, that's the German Nutrition Society. To the left-hand side of this chart, close to the red bar, you can see the figures in nanomole, again, divide by two and a half, and they consider sufficient ply to be in excess of 20 nanograms. Well, I'm not sure. They would consider suboptimal or insufficient supplementation any value between 12 and 20 nanograms, and they would only identify deficient supply below 12 nanograms. This is not quite in line with what we're seeing today. Take a look at the information provided by the Institute of Medicine here. We're going to talk about these guys later on. And if you look at Holick, I think he is the reference with regard to vitamin D3. He also performed studies on subjects in Africa, Tanzania, Maasai hunters, and he was able to show that their concentration, their concentrations go up to 40 or even 60 nanograms. This is why he recommends very much the same value, 40 to 60 nanograms at the University Hospital of Hamburg. Another study was carried out looking at the vitamin D3 levels of road casualties, fatalities in this particular case, and it emerged that only 7 out of 82 casualties had a concentration in excess of 20 nanograms. All the others had less and all of them showed insufficient bone density or even osteoporosis or a pre-stage. So the conclusion was that it, the concentration should be at least at 30 nanograms. In Germany uh, we would consider 30 nanograms to be sufficient and healthy. Um, we have a slightly different opinion. Why? Let's take a look at other countries. California for example we can see their recommendation. They consider any concentration below 20 nanograms to be deficient. 20 to 30 is considered to be insufficient, so still suboptimal, a deficiency below 20, an insufficiency between 20 and 30, and sufficient as of 30, between 30 and 100 nanograms. And if it's more than 100 nanograms, they say no comment due to lack of um, common expert opinion. But everyone agrees that you can only expect negative effects as of 150 nanograms. Let's take a look at the different levels and how they can be categorized. 
Here's a meta study which summarizes many other studies. Several hundreds of studies were examined here. Here we have nanograms again, that's the top line here, the very first line in this table. Here's the 20 nanograms required or suggested by the Institute of Medicine. These 20 nanograms can only just about prevent rickets or any other severe deficiency symptom. Here's the green line for the Americans, 20 to 24. That's where the Europeans are, more or less. Certainly not much better. To the left, we have a list of diseases, which also includes um, fractures, for example, but also heart diseases, heart attacks, the most frequent cause of death for men. Here's the green bar between 26 and 32. Here, the risk goes down by 30%. And here's breast cancer being the number one killer for women, just about to be overtaken by Alzheimer's disease. And here, as of 32 nanograms, the incidence or the risk to develop breast cancer goes down by 30%. At 15 nanograms, we see a reduction by 83%. So here's the bulk of cancer diseases and we can see that they substantially decrease here down to 60-54% with levels or concentrations beyond 50 nanograms. Take a look at this line here, that's the African tribes they have a concentration of 48 nanograms in line with Hollick's study and Maasai hunters. We can also see that outdoor workers in late summer, working on the fields for example, have a concentration of about 50 nanograms. Consequently, this meta-study recommends 50 to 60 nanograms because it helps to prevent the lion's share of chronic diseases. It's as simple as that to reach this level. To invest 50 cents to 1 euros to keep yourself healthy. In Germany you wouldn't even get an espresso for this. Perhaps in Italy, certainly not at Lake Constance and even less so in Zurich. So a very limited investment in order to prevent chronic diseases to make sure you have a vitamin D3 concentration between 40 and 60 nanograms. Why is it that our levels are so low? As we just saw, this is the recommendation by the Institute of Medicine. And a short time ago, the data was reviewed and recalculated. Creighton University did that, and they also published their study. At the Institute of Medicine, they established a formula to identify the amounts to be substituted or supplemented in order to reach a level of 20 nanograms. At least, that is. This is what we can see here. And if you actually take this um, form formula, and that's what the guys here did, they took this formula and recalculated the values because the result of the formula, according to the Institute of Medicine, was 600 international units per day in order to reach at least 20 nanograms. But if you recalculate using their formula, you find out that they'll actually find 9,000 international units per day. How did that happen? Well, they simply made a mistake. Um, such things happen. I wasn't an ace at maths myself, but I think it is quite questionable if people making recommendations make a mistake in their basic calculations and and fail to hit the target by almost a factor of 10. Here's the reference to the literature and you can verify that this was indeed the case. Let me now move on to Professor Hollick. He is the um, reference for vitamin D3. He will also be here with us in autumn, the Swiss Biohealth Days, where we'll be able to welcome him. I'm already looking forward to very interesting days. He was the one to develop the form of storage and um, the hormone 
to do with vitamin D3 and published a study on this, a fantastic person. And it's really worthwhile to hear him speak live. I can only highly recommend this um, session then in autumn. And he just confirms what we have been promoting from the Education Centre for many, many years. He also developed this app, DMinder Pro. It's a freeware you can just download. And it's very interesting to see how it works. This was the 23rd of March. Vitamin D3 from 1018 to 1637. So I know exactly when the sun is at the highest point at 1327. If I then expose my body to the sun, I can click on this um, button here, start sun exposure, and the app then tells me when to get out of the sunlight again in order not to get sunburned. That's something we definitely want to avoid, and here we fully concur with all the official recommendations. And we can also calculate how much vitamin D3 we need to supplement and together with sun exposure we get the appropriate amount. In order for this app to work properly you need to activate location tracking services which you might not want to do but uh, it's something you need to do for, in order for this app to work and it actually calculates the final amount you can um, obtain. Here's the QR code if you want to download the app. This is Swiss Biohealth News from the 30th of March. So it's a highly recommendable piece of information and I also highly recommend this app. It's freeware you can download um, for nothing. Let's now take a look at skin cancer more closely. Professor Hollick recommends that we do expose our skin to the sun because there are other benefits as well. We simply feel better, we feel more comfortable. But of course, the question is, doesn't sun exposure increase the risk of skin cancer? I made the point earlier, try and avoid UVA radiation in the early morning and in the early evening, because this increases the risk of skin cancer. Here's another overview study. This is the link for you to take a closer look at. And here's a whole list of um, insights, a whole list of findings. Now you might remember that um, suntan lotions today contain much stronger sunscreens than in the past. When I was young there was no sunscreens in the lotions at all. And then Pitts Buin came along and when we went into the mountains for skiing we applied suntan lotions perhaps with a factor of 4 or 6. Some crazy guys had a factor of 10. Today it starts at 30 or 35. Now despite that the rate of skin cancer more than doubled and it would be obvious that if sunscreens were to help to prevent skin cancer, you would expect the skin cancer rate to go down with more sunscreens in the sun lotions today. But that did not happen. And something else is very interesting here. Other substances were identified. Supertoxins, as they're called, oxybenzones, for example, but also titanium oxide was identified as being contained in sunscreens, which uh, has been classified by the National Institute of Occupational Healthy and Health, Safety and Health and the WHO as being carcinogenic. This is the interesting aspect skin cancer only started to explode after we started adding stronger sunscreens to our suntan lotions. Now at the very bottom you can see the result of a different study. The usual 500 most popular brands of sunscreens actually increase the speed of the growth of malignant cells that can eventually cause um, skin cancer. So, as we can see, 
suntan lotions do not protect us against skin cancer. This study actually says that skin cancer is caused by sunscreen in suntan lotions. This might be new for some of you, but I've got more for you. Here's one of the most famous institutes around the world, the Karolinska Institute. They observed um, women over 20 years of age. They looked at the, their habit of exposing themselves to the sun, but also smoking. And what was interesting is that non-smokers who avoided sun exposure had a life expectancy similar to smokers in the highest sun exposure group, which means that 20 years, 30,000 women have produced this result, a result produced by one of the most widely renowned institutes uh, around the world, the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. So avoiding sun exposure is as dangerous as smoking. So the best approach would be, of course, not to smoke and expose yourself to the sun. Here's another study uh, which I would like to recommend to you. This study looked at the target value of 45 nanograms in the United States. As we know, the value is somewhere between 20 and 24 nanograms, as we saw on an earlier slide. If we were to reach 45 nanograms in the United States, more than 400,000 lives could be saved. We can either achieve this by sun exposure or supplementation, and we could save 400,000 lives in the United States alone by reaching 45 nanograms. Now, with COVID-19, we've got 50,000 deaths. So the question, of course, is what is the proportionality here? What should we be focusing on? Now, it is a tragedy that COVID-19 causes so many deaths. But we've got to acknowledge that around the world, every single day, about 500 to 600,000 people die. Every day, one day after the other. So let's assume it's 500,000 to make our maths easier. Over the last two, two months, we had 200,000 casualties from COVID-19. In the meantime, we had 500,000 deaths per day times 60. That's 30 million deaths as a result of chronic diseases, as a result of accidents, wars, suicides, starvation even. And I think we must not be selective in the way we apply our sympathy I fully advocate any approach to treat COVID-19, but if I hadn't died um, of COVID-19, that's two and a half thousand in Germany alone, I would feel slightly neglected simply by looking at the attention COVID-19 got with regard to all the consequences this will have over the next 50 years. So I think it's important to look at the real causes here and to attack there because we mustn't be selective and say, well, this group of people is more important than the 50,000 kids dying of starvation every day around the world. Over the past few weeks, I haven't read any headline about starvation around the world. We can also use our food to protect ourselves. The principle here is photoprotection. That's basically products containing high levels of lycopenes, uh, carotenoids or flavon flavonoids, which you might have heard of, which protect us. These substances are present to a high level in um, tomatoes, carrots and peppers. You may have wondered why the leaves of these plants do not develop skin cancer because they're exposed to the sunlight all day without any protection. Well, the answer is simple. They simply contain high levels of these photoprotective substances. So if you can um, take up as much of these products, you can help 
protect your skin against sunlight. In the second part of the longevity code, I already made a point with regard to diets. I presented different forms of diets. And I also said that it's important to save our planets to reduce the world hunger. And if we want to achieve this, we should be vegetarians or vegans, or at least hobby vegetarians or flexitarians. I think we mustn't be dogmatic in any way because any dogmatic approach causes stress and stress is the worst influence on our health in general. The further down our food is in the food chain, the more heavy metals, the more toxic substances we take up. It's just a fact and it's also logical. These substances all build up through the food chain and simply by reducing the amount of meat we eat, we can save millions of lives at a much lower cost compared to what we have now with lockdown and any other measures. Let's take a look at vegans now for a moment. We can see that meat eaters, the carnivores, are at 77, that's um, nanomole divided by two and a half, which gives us about 30 or 28 roughly nanograms compared to the vegans. Vegans showing 55.8, that's about 25 nanograms. It's not a big gap, but it does emerge very clearly that vegans have a higher risk of um, having a low level of vitamin D3 and need to expose themselves to the sunlight much more, particularly over the summer months at an angle of insulation of 45 degrees or supplement vitamin D3. Obviously, the best solution would be to live in the right place, to have enough sun exposure, um, but it's uh, still better to supplement vitamin D3 rather than doing nothing. Let me come back to suntan lotions for a moment. Hawaii um, is the first US state to ban sunscreens, particularly oxybenzones and octinoxate. They must no longer be contained in suntan lotions, or these suntan lotions must not be sold again, because these super toxins attack, poison and kill the coral reefs. If you Google this, you'll find thousands of reports on this topic, but there will be no single uh, report on the question whether or not these two super toxins actually have an impact on humans. Actually, it's five super toxins, whether they have a harmful impact on human beings. Now, the skin covers one and a half to two meters um, in terms of area, depending on how tall you are. It, but this suntan lotion won't evaporate. Sunlight actually breaks down the sunscreens into dangerous radicals. Our skin is one of the best resorption organs that exist. We can very easily resorb substances through our skin. This is why we have magnesium sulfate baths, for example because this is a kind of treatment that is very beneficial. And just imagine what happens if um, mothers at the beach spray their children with sunscreens every half hour. It's quite obvious that this is going to have an impact on the immune system of these little kids. We've all got to take our own decisions. I've taken the decision for myself and for our family. What I try to do is pass on this information to you to help you make an informed decision. What happens in case of vitamin D deficiency? Here's a list and um, all the symptoms we do not want to see as dentists. We don't want to see anything that compromises the quality of the bone. We want to get rid of all of this. Some comedians or pranksters think, well, it's great to lose all your teeth because you can then um, replace them by implants. 
Well, make no mistake, if you lose your teeth, you will also lose your implants in the long run. And of course, we also want to avoid sleep disorders because deep sleep is absolutely vital in order to reduce your stress level. And vitamin D3 simply helps you to sleep better and to show better sleep pattern. Now, if you try to cover your demand by eating more butter and mayonnaise, it's going to be very difficult. You can see with plants here, you can also take up ergo calciferol with avocado. 100 grams of avocado shouldn't be too difficult, which will give you 200 units. Very good, very high quality vitamin D2 in this case, which will be metabolized just as well. Herring is even better. And some of us, like me, had to take cod liver oil as children. We can see only cod liver oil manages to give us more than 13,000 units per 100 grams. Even though that is a lot, I'm not sure it's possible to take 100 grams or 100 milliliters of cod liver oil without having to throw up. We just had to take a spoonful, which would still have given us 800 to 1,000 units, which is much better than nothing. This cod liver oil helped the Inuits to survive in areas where no vitamin D3 can be built. Then the whale hunt was banned, and since then, since the whale hunt was banned, the rate of cases of osteoporosis has gone up markedly. In the meantime, almost 100% of women above 30 have osteoporosis, and the life expectancy has gone down to 35 years. Now let's take a look at the effects of vitamin D3. Vitamin D3 regulates hormones, hormone processes in our tissues, and calcitriol is in charge of the transcription of more than 2,000 specific genes. It's a bit like the master key the master key to 2,000 apartments in a high-rise building, just to show you how important vitamin D3 is. It's very important with regard to cell division and cell repair mechanisms, and it's quite obvious that the positive effect will also be with regard to cancer. The sites where calcitriol derivatives show their effect, calcitriol being the vitamin D3 hormone which promotes calcium and phosphate resorption in the intestine providing the basis for mineralization. The same happens in the bone as a result of calcitriol balanced good mineralization. It activates osteoblasts, that's the bone forming cells, and it inhibits osteoclasts, that's the bone degrading cells. Now, some of the um, dental companies come up with great products, and if they were to supply a product which activates osteoblasts and inhibits osteoclasts, we would take it for any money in the world. But here we can get it for free. With calcitriol, we get it at no cost at all. We just get it for free. In the kidney, the vitamin D3 hormone promotes the reabsorption of calcium and phosphate, keeping the level of minerals and calcium high which we need to ensure proper bone density. It's also preconditioned for insulin to be released but also for the synthesis and release of thyroid hormones and the secretion of parathyroid hormones. So as you can see we have a large number of effects. It's very effective on numerous levels but also with regard to calcium transport in our muscles as we will see later from a study from Zurich, that women or elderly people with a higher vitamin D3 level don't fall as often. So not just fewer bone fractures, they also fall less frequently. In tumor cells, calcitriol inhibits cell division and um, counteracts tumor growth. But it goes we can go further. Vitamin D3 has an important impact on the immune system because it um, has an impact on lymphocytes and monocytes. There's a clear connection between the concentration of um, circulating immunoproteins 
and vitamin D status. The immunoproteins supporting our immune system, which is particularly important in times of coronavirus. The monocytes and macrophages um, fighting bacteria and other germs have calcitriol receptors, vitamin D3 receptors, which can only be beneficial if there is a sufficient amount of calcitriol in the cells themselves. Then we have interleukin 2, which is an inflammation mediator. Interleukin 2 is inhibited by calcitriol and the T lymphocyte function is suppressed as well. In inflammations, we can see that the T lymphocytes are inhibited by calcitriol and the cytotoxicity of macrophages is increased. This basically means that we fight or influence positively chronic illnesses. The very first edition of the Longevity Code, we heard about the importance of chronic illnesses and that they make our body grow older much more quickly. Faster aging means um, a higher risk, a higher likelihood of um, suffering from chronic illnesses. This is why David Sinclair from Harvard University says there's only one real disease, one real illness, aging. And if we can slow down the aging, we limit the risk of chronic illnesses, something which is uh, substantiated by the development in COVID-19. Mice were injected with vitamin D3 and it, it was possible to show that the onset of multiple sclerosis was inhibited. The same is true for um, a study produced by Dr. Coimbra from Sao Paulo. The immune system is strengthened as well. We have various mechanisms in terms of an immune response. We have an acquired immune response which can overshoot in case of immune reactions, which is regulated down. We also have an intrinsic immune response. And this intrinsic immune response is regulated up. We also have antimicrobial proteins, which are strengthened with calcitriol, and they are more effective and more efficient in killing bacteria and germs than the acquired immune response, which will first have to activate defense cells. So calcitriol is extremely important with the immune response. Overshooting immune responses are prevented and the fast reaction on um, viruses, bacteria, viruses like SARS-CoV-2 will be improved and the resistance to flu is the result of another effect, the inhibition of the NFKB transcription factor. Let's now look at D3 and oral health. This is a point we have been making for the past 10 years. We believe that periodontitis or periodontosis, as um, people generally call it, um, is influenced as well. Actually, it should be periodontitis, not periodontosis, because periodontosis would be a non-inflammatory gingival recession which suggests that this has got something to do with oral hygiene. We criticize patients uh, of poor oral hygiene, which causes the gums to become inflamed. You've got to um, come to the practice on a regular basis, practice with dental floss and water pick, etc. This is not correct. We have evidence to support this. And if you claim that something else is the case, you simply stigmatize those patients suffering from this condition in an unjustified way. The latest studies clearly show, and I'm referring to a report from 2018, and it's in line with what we've been saying for many, many years. These studies prove this very mechanism. The patient suffers from a l lack of vitamin D3 or deficiencies, or other deficiencies. Think of scurvy, for example. The seamen in ancient times, um, for months, or weeks at least, didn't have any fresh vegetables or fruit. They suffered from severe vitamin C deficiency, which caused an inflammation of the gums of the gingiva and a loss of teeth. 
So periodontitis is the scurvy of the 21st century and it basically means that we have an inflammation of the gums, of the gingiva. Gingival inflammation, like any other inflammation, is painful and because it's painful we don't brush properly because it's simply painful to brush inflamed gums which means that there is caries forming uh, on the teeth but that's at the end of the cascade triggered uh, with periodontitis or periodontosis. It's not at the beginning of the cascade so there's no point in criticizing our patients for, poor, for having poor oral hygiene. They simply suffer from a um, deficiency from vitamin D deficiency and a weaker immune system which uh, causes the inflammation. This issue has clearly been over uh, dealt with. We can provide even more evidence. We're actually about to start another study with um, a university. We will look at patients with periodontitis and we will not treat them conservatively whatsoever. I mean, you know what the other dentists do, um, cutting the gums, uh, scratching around, removing inflamed tissue, and all they removed was demineralized white bone. The bone could have been remineralized by adding vitamin D3 and cofactors. Then um, a bone substitute material was used or Teflon sleeves with titanium reinforcement, etc. It's sheer folly. I did that as well in my early years as a dentist. And it didn't work anyway. The result was that patients had black triangles, which means that between the teeth, the gums had receded completely. It didn't look great. And secondly, patients also suffered from cervical tooth sensitivity. At our practice, we have no single patient suffering from cervical tooth sensitivity. Why? Cervical tooth sensitivity is something we'll look at later. This is the result of hypomineralization, a lack of mineralization, and the result of a vitamin D deficiency. So if we have a patient with periodontitis and supplement this patient with vitamin D3, we know what the result will be. That's exactly what we're going to do with this study because we've been doing it for years. So we are going to provide one month of high dosage D3 and cofactors and I can tell you already that the periodontitis or periodontosis will be gone 100%. I can guarantee that. This is something we've done 10,000 times over the past 10 years so I already can anticipate the result of the study. Obviously tartar won't be removed, will have to be removed, it will have to be removed with a scalar or ultrasound treatment, but this is what state-of-the-art periodontitis treatment looks like. Everything else is equivalent to deliberately injuring the patient and there's scientific evidence to substantiate this. Let's take a look at the fantastic four and more. Vitamin D3 and more is not omnipotent. Let me make this point very clear. It's like with a symphonic orchestra. If you just have the drummer playing, it won't sound great unless the composition only features the drummer. What you really want is to hear the entire orchestra play, which is why the cofactors are very important, supporting everyone else, everything else. Here we can see magnesium at various levels. We'll come back to this point. We also need zinc. We need vitamin A, very important, vitamin K2. And here we have the different cofactors that have an impact and interact. And we'll talk about them all in detail. Here's one of my favorite slides that I keep showing time and time again. And usually this is the moment where everyone takes out their cameras to take a photograph or actually film the sequence. It took us weeks and weeks to um, come up with this slide and animate it properly. To the left we have the intestine, the small intestine. In the middle is the blood vessels and to the right it's the bone. So let's assume we have 20,000 units of vitamin D3 supplemented on a daily basis. This is what we do before surgical intervention and after surgical intervention. Usually 10,000 units are enough uh, every day unless you have a strong deficiency then you would have to go up with the dosage. 
in order to produce vitamin D3 storage form and hormone form, we need um, magnesium 2 plus. We'll talk about this later, 2,000 milligrams per day, 2 grams, not the elementary form. And if we succeed that, we can form the hormone in every cell, but particularly also in the liver and the kidney and other organs in our body. And the cofactors will be present as well. And then calcitriol can be produced, vitamin D3 hormone. And the vitamin D3 hormone helps us in the intestine, the small intestine, to resorb magnesium, calcium and phosphorus and reabsorb them. Now, this means that we have a sufficient level of minerals in our body to be pumped into the blood system. But we don't want to have too many minerals in the blood system because too many minerals in the blood system in the blood vessels causes arteriosclerosis which is dangerous as well so we always have to supplement cofactor k2 you cannot supply you must not supply vitamin d3 without um, the cofactors mk7 mk2 about 100 years ago um western price chairman of the research and study committee of the american dental association found something very interesting which is extremely important and continues to be very important he called it the x factor patients who didn't have the x factor lost many teeth bone fractures carious lesions tooth deformations and they called it the x factor and then christopher master john in 2006 looked at western prices study and the tufts university study and found that this activator x this x factor is actually vitamin k2 and k7 and we substitute 200 micrograms per day this is the um, order of magnitude we're talking about so two grams of magnesium as the first cofactor then 200 micrograms vitamin k2 as a second factor and 20,000 units of vitamin d3 vitamin k2 now activates um, the matrix gla protein and the result is that the level of minerals is reduced in our blood vessels the calcium level goes down and is actually dissolved out of the vessel wall so that the blood vessels become more flexible. Some people develop arteriosclerosis um, in older age, but you can also develop it at a younger age. Now, with this mechanism, the minerals are reabsorbed and at the same time, vitamin K2 also works at a different level it works on the bone there's calcitriol as well vitamin d3 hormone in the bone and as we saw earlier it inhibits the osteoclasts the bone degrading cells and it activates the osteoblasts the bone forming cells you can also replace osteoblasts by odontoblasts but it didn't fit on the slide in the bubble odontoblasts are the osteo blasts but in the teeth the cells forming teeth, tooth substance in charge of tooth health preventing carious lesions and um, improving bone health we'll see an interesting study on this later on what we also want to have in this equation is vitamin c because it's also a member of the fantastic four here we supplement one to ten grams per day vitamin c also activates the osteoblasts and the odontoblasts the bone forming cells it's also in charge of organizing the bone structure basically through the pre-stage called collagen and it's also a um, radical catcher and has an anti-inflammatory effect it also inhibits osteoclasts and now we come back to vitamin k2 mk7 because it activates the osteocalcin formed by the osteoblasts as a result of this activation process minerals are integrated into the bone because at the end of the of the day the bone is nothing else than a, a mineral storage site women suffering from osteoporosis 
uh, do not suffer from a shortage of calcium. They have too much calcium, but in the wrong place, in the blood vessels. Patients suffering from osteoporosis almost always also suffer from arteriosclerosis. They've got too much calcium here and a lack of calcium to the right-hand side. If we um, administer calcium to these patients, the risk for developing a heart attack goes up by a factor of 600. That would be the wrong treatment. So we need vitamin D3 and K2 to move calcium from the left to the right, from the middle to the right. Here we need a great deal of calcium because this is a storage site if we want to be successful in our surgical intervention. It's not just about implants and um, dental surgery. It equally applies to hip, hip replacement. If one of the cofactors were to be missing K2, for example, we can see the cascade breaks down. What happens? Calcium in the blood vessels goes up while the calcium in the storage site in the bone goes down. If we now eliminate vitamin D3 or vitamin C, the entire system collapses completely, the result being osteoporosis, almost always combined with arteriosclerosis, because a lack of calcium in the bone will be the result. Too much calcium in the blood vessels. At the same time, we'll see periodontitis developing and caries, tooth caries, because without vitamin D3, we do not form osteocalcin. Without K2, K7, the osteocalcin doesn't become activated and the tooth doesn't become activated and strengthened. So forget about uh, supplementing too much from outside, uh, fantastic um, products, strengthening the enamel of the tooth. We need to think from inside out. We shouldn't think about um, something we can apply from outside, be it suntan lotion or some uh, varnish for sensitive cervical parts of the tooth. Um, no, it doesn't work. It has to come from inside. That's the general principle. Uh, when We are an, not a test tube that we can simply experiment with. We're an extremely complex organism that we need to support. Let's take a closer look at what the studies say. On this slide, I'm showing various studies. What you can do now is stop the YouTube stream, enter the titles of these publications on PubMed and download the studies for yourself to read. In order to save time, I'm showing you a summary here. There's hundreds of studies proving that vitamin D activates the osteoblasts, it inhibits osteoclasts and produces better and higher bone volume and better higher mineralization. This is exactly what we need um, in case of bone surgery, particularly with regard to implants, dental implants. Let's look at dental health now. I referred to a report from CCP online before, but there are many more studies to substantiate the same thing. Um, look at our website Swiss Dental Solutions and you can download a free compilation of studies, 240 pages strong. You can get those studies on paper as well. This was expensive to produce, but we decided not to sell it. We feel everyone should be aware of the current um, state of the art in medicine. So this uh, compilation reflects the latest information we have. And what we get as a summary is that vitamin D has a positive influence on periodontitis, but also on MIH. There used to be a controversy over MIH, that's molar incisor hypomineralization. What does it mean? Basically, molar teeth or frontal teeth have deficient mineralization, the surfaces are destroyed, Children at a very young age have destroyed teeth, um, substantial damage to the animal, animal, and they have to be crowned over or even extracted. And we anticipated early on that this is the result of a lack of vitamin D. In the meantime, we have the scientific proof. You can read it all up. MIH, molar incisor hypermineralization, is the result of a lack of of vitamin D3 or a general nutrient deficiency. The same is true 
for caries. We can prevent caries. We can actually also reverse caries, the formation of caries. We can reverse the process and heal it, but not from outside, but from inside, because dental health is better. Let's now take a closer look at pregnancy and breastfeeding. There are many, many studies here. You can have a closer look at if you want. Here's our summary. It's absolutely clear. Supplementing vitamin D during pregnancy will have a very positive effect on the dental health of the baby. Weston Price already made the point a long time ago, 100 years ago, and he also said that we need something more than just vitamin D3, K2, MK7. If this is supplemented during pregnancy, there is a reduced risk of misalignment of teeth or the necessity of dental braces. It's also important during a coronavirus to look at the connection between COVID-19, influenza and vitamin D3. So we talk about both influenza and COVID-19. It's quite clear that if the vitamin D3 level is um, above 30 nanograms per milliliter, we have a substantial decrease in the risk for acute respiratory tract infections. Vitamin D3 can also reduce the frequency of flus and it also um, reduces the receptors of ACE2 angiotensin converting enzyme. This was one reason, um, as was suspected, that people in northern Italy suffered from COVID that much because they take ACE inhibitors, ibuprofen and aspirin. Now you would have thought, well, they inhibit the ACE um, receptors and SARS-CoV-2 cannot attack the receptors. Well, that's wrong because ACE inhibitors actually cause the cell to produce even more receptors, providing more opportunities for SARS-CoV-2 to bind to the cell. So taking ACE inhibitors is a fundamental mistake in treating people suffering from COVID-19. Definitely the wrong way to go. And this is precisely where vitamin D3 comes into play, because vitamin D3 clearly regulates ACE. Let me ask you a question. Can vitamin D3 actually protect us against COVID-19? Here we have the nephew of the legendary former American president, John F. Kennedy. It's Robert Kennedy. And he clearly says, yes, we can. He's got this website here, Children's Health Defense. He's very committed to the cause here. And he says, COVID-19 and vitamin D, could we be missing something simple? This is the question he's asking here. And here's a list of questions he asks. And he also provides a wide overview over the literature that I would recommend. Uh, you can scan the QR code here and immediately access the literature. I don't know what the situation is like today, but three years ago at least, Donald Trump actually appointed uh, him to lead the vaccine committee. He probably wouldn't do this today because otherwise we wouldn't see such an unfavorable development as we're seeing in the US now. Robert F. Kennedy is fairly critical with regard to vaccines and he doesn't just support them um, unconditionally. Let's look at um, the latest study on D3 and coronavirus. This is a study which was published in March 2020. This study says that vitamin D3 reduces the risk of RTI, that's respiratory tract infections. And the paper also says, that's what you can read here in the middle, by reducing pro-inflammatory cytokines, cytokines promoting inflammation through the innate immune system, thereby reducing the risk of a cytokine storm leading to pneumonia and consequently to death with regard to COVID-19. So vitamin D3 clearly reduces this risk. In the first part of the longevity code, we already talked at length about the cytokine storm 
we have to avoid at all cost. The cytokine storm can be triggered by a number of um, factors, is predisposed as a result of stress and others, and we have to avoid getting into this pro-inflammatory state. And this is precisely what vitamin D3 does. It does reduce pro-inflammatory cytokines. So as we can see, there clearly is a connection here. At least a level of 30 nanograms in D3, which has a very positive impact on the degree of severity of the disease, or indeed whether or not you actually develop a disease after having caught the virus. Let's now take a look at this chart, ladies and gentlemen. We can see that uh, those patients with a value above 60 versus 20 nanograms of stored vitamin, those with a value in excess of 60 developed fewer flu-like symptoms or a disease in general, so that's a very clear result. Here's another study, which is a meta-analysis performed not far away from here by Professor Bischoff Ferrari at the University of Zurich. This study clearly shows that older people and D3 develop a correlation. When they take vitamin D3 at a level of 700 and 1000 units a day which isn't much but this limited amount already reduces the risk of falling by 20% so this is another argument in favor of supplementing vitamin D3 to older people. This is a study that was sent to me from the um, HIV outpatient clinic at the University of Bonn and here we see that um, vitamin D3 is also highly relevant with HIV infection. This is really interesting. Just think back of 1983 when HIV um, came up for the first time. We all assumed that within a short period of time, within a few years, millions of people would have died from HIV. Now, I'm not denying this, of course, but take a look at what the Robert Koch Institute says today on their website. They say that people with HIV today have a life expectancy which is almost similar to everyone else. So I think the situation has markedly improved since then with regard to HIV. What was interesting is that the 316 HIV uh, patients there showed vitamin D3 deficiency, particularly those from Africa and Latin America. Why? The darker the skin, the less vitamin D3 I take up. It's easier for human beings with brighter skin to take up vitamin D3. And people with overweight and an increased body mass index also take up less vitamin D3. And the same is true for people with a lack of exercise. Now, it's the eternal question of the chicken and the egg. Is the HIV infection the consequence of D3 deficiency or is the deficiency the result, the consequence of the HIV infection? That's a very interesting question. Let me come back to the study by a Professor Heike Bischoff-Ferrari. We can see that high-performance athletes have a higher risk of suffering from vitamin D3 deficiency. Conversely, when exposed to UVB lamps and when um, vitamin D3 is supplemented, the top athletes show a higher performance level. This is something I've been teaching many, many times over. The more we lead a high octane life, the more work we do, the more intensively we work, the more vitamin D3 we need and use. So top athletes clearly require a higher supply of vitamin D3. My colleague, Professor Ganati, performs 14 hour long, extremely complex cranio-maxillofacial surgeries with tumor patients, disassembling almost the entire face. And he administers 600,000 units on the day before the surgery, simply because the required supply is so high for such an extreme intervention and the same is true for the day after several hundred thousands of units of vitamin D3. Now, what's interesting is to see that 
um, patients with metastases show a substantial drop in the vitamin D3 level before metastases are formed. Check out the relevant YouTube link if you would like to see more information and Professor Ganati's statement on this very matter. This goes to show that more vitamin D3 is used and after that metastases are formed. So it's interesting to see the interplay between the different factors. If you lead a high octane life, if you work a lot and very intensively so, you clearly have require more vitamin D3. There is another interesting new study and you can see my name here, uh, a study which I carried out together with um, Professor Ganati and um, Professor Huber, member of the Swiss Biohealth Academy. We issued what we call a mother paper to provide some sort of fundament, a basis for um, dental surgery. We published it a few days ago. The study is called 100 Years After Vitamin D Discovery. Is there clinical evidence for supplementation doses? So we're looking at the evidence. We're looking at the doses. And we first describe what vitamin D3 does as a principle. Well, it clearly supports the innate and acquired immune system and regulates inflammatory processes at various levels. For example, on the level of the macrophages, it also reduces pro-inflammatory cytokines. This is a point we discussed earlier. So we are less in a pro-inflammatory process. There is a reduced risk for a pro-inflammatory storm. And Anti-inflammatory cytokines are promoted, which has a positive impact on a large number of types of cancer. But the same is true for the risk of viral infections. I'm not just talking about COVID-19. I'm also referring to run-of-the-mill viruses or rhinoviruses. And here we have a cautious statement which says that vitamin D3 has a potential role with regard to the pandemic we're seeing with the coronavirus. So this is a mother paper that we dentists can use. And here's something interesting. As part of the study, Professor Ganati looked at his team at the university in Frankfurt. And here's what he found. Only about 12% were above 30 nanograms while a large number of team members were between 0 and 10 nanograms, almost clinically dead. That's a dramatic hibernation mode. Almost half of his team members were in this category. Based on these results, we've chosen to perform a prospective study in maxillofacial plastic surgery, neurology and cardiology at the Goethe University in Frankfurt. Now, in our paper, we have chosen to set up a scheme, a structure to tell us on how to supplement. This is scientifically proven. You can use it the way it is here. Now, some people will take more. I take more. And some people will say, well, you're taking way too much. But what it's important here is that we find an overlap with other studies, other papers that have an influence. It's important to find a common denominator. I know that many take much more, but we've got to make sure we have an overlap so as to have a common starting point. So here's our basic principle. We want to get a target value of 40 to 80 nanograms, which I think is really good because we're 20 nanograms above the value which has emerged from the meta-analysis. You will remember it was between uh, 40 and 60. So we're saying 40 to 80, we go 20 nanograms higher. And we say if you have a vitamin D level below 40 nanograms per milliliter, you should take 10,000 units per day. Whenever we talk about units, always bear in mind that you need to add the cofactors into the equation because then we can achieve much more with the units rather than just taking D3 per se. 
if you take the cofactors, 10,000 units have an effect of 20 or 30,000 units. So much more efficacy when the cofactors are present. Once you've achieved a level of 40 to 80 nanograms, we recommend you take 5,000 units per day. And if you are in excess of 80 nanograms, you can reduce to 1,000 units per day. And it's always important to check your level every three months to see where you are and then proceed according to this um, scheme. I know that many viewers know how to handle their D3 level very, very well. This is not for you. But what we wanted to do was to set up a principle, a scheme that is workable, that can be applied on an international level and that will take us a major step forward. For those of you who have chosen to take more, you can see that our data clearly shows one thing. Even if you take 20,000 units per day over 12 months, that's no problem at all. There is no toxicity at all. Something else is very important. This has got nothing to do with the study. Always bear in mind that vitamin D3 has a half-life of only 24 hours. So if you take a D-crystal tablet once a week, this makes no sense at all because after 24 hours, the 20,000 units will be gone completely. It's important to supplement every single day. Why? Well, we cannot store vitamin D3 simply because there was no need in nature to do this. Mankind was born in Africa with 365 days of sunshine with an angle of insulation of more than 45 degrees. So it was always possible to produce vitamin D3 for the human body and there was no need to store it. Once we've transformed it into calcidiol, calcidiol that is the storage um, form of vitamin D3, we are looking at a half-life of three to four weeks and this is what we're measuring now. If you have such a test, you measure Calcidiol. It makes no sense to measure the cell hormone, the cell form of vitamin D3, calcitriol, because it will only be there for one to three hours. So by the time you have the sample in the lab, it will be gone. What you can measure is calcidiol through the parathyroid hormone because it's in a balance. Um, calcitriol goes up and um, parathyroid hormone goes down. And this is the way to measure. This is what uh, Professor Quimbra does in Sao Paulo as part of his high dosage therapies. He measures how much vitamin D3 actually gets to the cell by pushing uh, parrot hormone to the bottom level. And then he knows that there's enough calcitriol in the cell to suppress the T helper cells, which will then also have a positive impact on multiple sclerosis. So this is very important. Supplement every day. It's better to take a small dose every day than a large dose once a week. That's the reason why many studies have produced false results in the past. We have now studied a vitamin D3 observational study, www.d3-study.org. You can scan the QR code here. So if you take vitamin D3 or know somebody who takes vitamin D3, um, put in the email address because we want to have hundreds if not thousands of people uh, that we can observe. It's just a little effort and an important contribution to making sure that vitamin D3 gains the significance it actually deserves. Let's now take a look at the most recent study on D3 and COVID-19 published a few days ago on the 23rd of April 2020. This study was able to show very clearly that there is an effect of vitamin D3. Take a look at this chart here. The green bar is levels above 30 nanograms. To the left we have the critical patients. Only 4% of those critical patients actually had a level in excess of 30 nanograms. The patients with 30 nanograms were all in the mild category to the very right. This goes to show very clearly that the lower your vitamin D3 level is, 
the more likely you are to develop a critical condition or at least severe symptoms. If my level is above 30 nanograms, this would still not be enough for us to perform surgery on a patient. We want to achieve a level of 70 nanograms preoperatively, but all the patients with more than 30 nanograms were in the mild category. A very nice study which illustrates clearly that vitamin D3 has an impact on the disease, the severity of COVID-19. So let's move on. We talked about the first of the Fantastic Four. The second one is vitamin K2 MK7, as you have seen before. Why does vitamin K2 MK7 play such a vital role? Well, it activates the matrix GLA proteins, which integrate minerals into the bone, our storage site, and it activates coagulation factors in the liver. It also activates osteocalcin in the bones and the integration of calcium into the bone, into our mineral storage deposit, while at the same time removing calcium from the vessel walls. As a result, it reduces or prevents arteriosclerosis. So in fact, this is a reversible process. And we can also imagine what happens if we want to reduce the risk of arteriosclerosis. We reduce any risk to do with coronary heart disease or heart attacks. Vitamin K2 MK7 doesn't cause any thickening of the blood or hypercoagulation. Other vitamins have an influence on coagulation, but vitamin K2 has no negative impact on the effect of anticoagulants. If you have to take Marcuma, for example, or other anticoagulants, aspirin 100, for example, up to a level to 100 microgram per day, you can easily take vitamin K2 MK7, and that would already be sufficient. So here's what we recommend. We've always got to ensure proportionality. Per 10,000 units of vitamin D3, 100 microgram vitamin K7, K2 MK7. Here's a few more studies on MK7 and mineralization. Vitamin K2 has a positive effect on the mineralization of the bone, osteoporosis and arteriosclerosis. There are many studies, such as the Rotterdam studies, with 5,000 women. This study clearly showed that when sufficient substitution of K2, MK7 was present, the risk for arteriosclerosis and heart attacks went down and osteoporosis was reduced as well. There are other positive effects, particularly with regard to longer life expectancy, general risk of fracture and one of the most important causes of death with elderly people is of course cervical hip fracture um, patients become bedridden develop pleural effusion a buildup of water on the lung pneumonia so this risk is dramatically in re reduced with vitamin k2 mk7 also with regard to the calcification of soft tissue arteriosclerosis caries and endocrine functions uh, like insulin or diabetes. Let's now move on to the next of the fantastic four, magnesium XX. Magnesium XX is basically magnesium 2 plus, magnesium citrate, which we do not take up in elementary form because our body can't process it. Magnesium basically contributes to the formation of more than 300 enzymes, just to show you how important it is. It clearly improves and actually prevents the aging of the cells, has a positive impact on our biological age. And everything which is positive for our biological age means that we reduce the risk of chronic diseases. So this is a very, very important mineral indeed. We know it relaxes the muscles, prevents muscle cramps. We take it in the evening because it makes us tired. Don't take it in the morning before sports. Take it in the evening. I would also recommend Epsom salt baths, magnesium sulfate baths, which aren't expensive, 
just put a handful into your bath water and um, then enjoy the bath for 15 to 20 minutes, particularly after physical exercise. So it's very important for athletes, but also for pregnant women and uh, breastfeeding women. It's also very good to prevent stress and cardiac arrhythmia. It stabilizes the cell walls and enzymes. It also provides energy as a result of transforming glucose. We know that it uh, increases the strength of teeth and bone. And it's also important with regard to the sodium potassium pump, which is like a mini battery. Usually two potassium ions, positively charged potassium ions are pumped into the cell and three positive sodium ions are pumped towards the outside of the pump. If we have a lack of magnesium, the sodium potassium pump doesn't work properly anymore and the mini battery won't work properly any longer. But it has to work properly because it is a source of energy for our human body. It's important for the uptake of nutrients and the discharge of waste products. And if we have a lack of magnesium, we have less energy, fewer nutrients in the cells, and we also have more waste products, which results in an intoxication of the cell. This is an overview of the symptoms we want to avoid as a result of magnesium deficiency, particularly as specialists in implantation and dental surgery. Everything to do with um, bone formation, obviously, but also with wound healing, with relaxation. We want to make sure that patients are in a parasympathetic mode, that they enjoy good sleep and to ensure proper wound healing. If we don't want to substitute it, where can we get magnesium from? Well, we can easily get it from pumpkin seeds, from almonds as well. We know that with almonds and water you can survive for years. Just remember what happened to one of the war criminals, Radovan Karadzic. He was found after many years and it was found that he only fed on almonds and water and had no deficiency symptoms at all. So there's a lot of magnesium in almonds, less so in walnuts, but we can find a substantial amount of magnesium in all the nuts. So nuts are very healthy in addition to providing healthy fatty acids. Let's see how magnesium interacts as a cofactor with vitamin D3. It does so on the skin uh, in the storage form 25OH which makes it responsible for a very good calcium level in the blood, but also an appropriate vitamin D3 level. Two levels are produced per hormone with an impact on calcitriol, that's vitamin D3 hormone, and it also has an impact on calcium absorption as well as the distribution of calcium to the different tissues and places in the human body. So magnesium XX has a very important role to play here. Let's move on to the last one of the Fantastic Four, which is vitamin C. Vitamin C is an extremely interesting vitamin and supplement for the human body. Basically, human beings are defective mutants, which means that tens of thousands of years ago, we were able to produce vitamin C ourselves like almost all other creatures, perhaps with the exception of those who are similar in their diet to human beings, that is to say monkeys. Monkeys aren't able to produce vitamin C themselves either. And here's the interesting bit. Take a look at an animal with a similar weight to human beings, between 50 and 80 kilograms. We would have the goat, for example they can produce vitamin C in the small intestine from glucose, 20 grams. So what's the logic here? How can nature help us? How is it that the German Nutrition Society suggests a daily dose of 75 milligrams against the background that one cigarette already uses up a thousand milligrams of vitamin C, 75 milligrams 
All it can do is prevent scurvy, but it's almost nothing in terms of quantity. Linus Pauling, who won two Nobel Prizes together with Cameron uh, for his research on vitamin C, Pauling suggests 10 to 20 grams on a daily basis, and he performed an interesting study with cancer patients. Those were inoperable cancer patients, so there was no hope for survival. It made no sense to perform surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, so basically go home and die. There's no hope for you. And all he did was um, apply a low-level therapy. He installed a permanent uh, cannula or a clip and give them, gave them 10 grams of vitamin C every day. That's cancer patients. We know that cancer is the mother of all diseases. We've got to attack from all sides. There's also a psychological background to it, a background to do with nutrition, exercise, etc. Many mechanisms come into play here. The teeth as well, obviously, um, toxins, etc. And he said, let's just go for a low-level therapy, 10 grams of vitamin C every day, and let's see what happens. These patients um, are terminally ill anyway. And this is what happened. One year down the line, 22% of patients were still alive. This is a lot. And in the control group, only 4% had survived. So with this kind of approach, we already have a simple, safe and effective treatment. So all we do is ensure permanent access, a permanent clip. You can leave the clips for three to six months. Many of our patients, particularly the ones from the US, already have this permanent clip, which makes it easy for us just to connect the infusion to the clip so it's not complex at all. And it also emerged clearly that um, up to 10 grams, there are no side effects. This is what we've been doing for the last 10 years as well. For surgery, we give 0.2 to 0.5 grams per kilogram body weight, which will give us 10 to 25 grams per day of infusion. And we will have a low drip, one to two drops per second. During a long surgery, we will keep the access open to make sure there is no coagulation and uh, clotting, because at the end of the surgery, we want to have the analgetic um, flow into the blood vessels so we make sure we have permanent access and for shorter surgeries we have faster drips and if i take a vitamin c infusion personally or if we get our patients prepared before the surgery or after the surgery we have a fairly fast drip to make sure we can complete the process within one hour now let's look at um, what vitamin c does vitamin c basically is ascorbic acid Let's take a look at what it does in the human body. Well, basically, it's a radical catcher or an antioxidant because it easily supplies electrons. Radicals are particles which lack electrons. They need more electrons and then attack um, metabolic processes or cell membranes or tissues and rip out electrons from these tissues, thereby destroying metabolic processes or the tissues. Radicals also occur during stress, with a bad diet, intoxications or smoking. Vitamin C is a very nice, a very benevolent molecule and provides electrons to these radicals. Now, the radicals then integrate the electron calms down and no longer attacks our structures this is why we call vitamin c a radical catcher or a reducing agent because it prevents oxidation and as a result of this it prevents the formation of carcinogenic nitrosamines or nitrosative stress we can see it also inhibits various peroxidases, DNA and protein peroxidases, as well as lipid membranes, and thereby prevents any damage. It promotes the formation of hydrogen peroxide, which has a um, cytotoxic effect on tumor cells. So what it does is it basically prevents and actually fights cancer cells, causes them to die. And what's 
also very important for us dentists is the function with regard to collagen. Collagen is very important in dentistry and for our skin. Vitamin C supports the formation of collagen by forming pro-collagen through lysine and proline and it therefore strengthens the quality of the skin, of connective tissue, teeth, bone and the gingiva. It also intensifies the activity of the osteoblasts, the bone forming cells, and it reduces and inhibits the activity of bone degrading cells, the osteoclasts. Vitamin C also has a role to play with regard to the use of fatty acids and make sure that there is no exhaustion, fatigue and muscle weaknesses and it also transforms cholesterol to bile acid. Vitamin C also protects against infections as a result of um, the synthesis of interferon and Ig and complementary synthesis. It also has a role to play in phagocytosis, the digestion of bacteria and viruses in other words as a result, we see an increased activity of the natural killer cells. Like vitamin D3, it protects against overshooting pro-inflammatory signals. The cytokine storm again. So vitamin C here has a similar function to vitamin D3. Vitamin C is also a very natural substance we can simply take from our environment not here at Lake Constance throughout the year, but if we were to live around the equator or in Brazil where we have the acerola cherry, we could easily take up enough vitamin C as we're going to see later. So we can simply get it from nature with little effort. It protects against the degradation of tissue. It strengthens our stress tolerance by having a positive effect on our neurotransmitters. And it also supports the detoxification process of our body. I've been showing this slide for many, many years because what's interesting is that the latest studies have shown that vitamin C infusions can easily be used for amalgam detoxification. And we just saw the explanation of the mechanism, which we have been um, talking about for many, many years. Let's now take a look at where we find significant amounts of vitamin C. Well, we think it's always good for our children to have a glass of orange juice every day. Well, not really. Orange juice only contains 52 milligrams of vitamin C per 100 grams or 100 milliliters of orange juice, which is almost nothing. All your child will get is diabetes rather than uh, vitamin C because there's simply too much sugar in orange juice. Take a look at berries here. Berries contain much more vitamin C. So we can't get enough berries. The advantage of berries is that they do not push up the insulin level because they don't have a high glycemic index. So berries are very good. I would recommend acerola cherries but also the traditional German plum contains high levels of vitamin C. Unfortunately, these plums are only available in late summer. What happens in case of a deficiency? Again, from the perspective of um, surgeons, doctors and dentists, this is what we don't want to see, but we can see that other areas are affected as well. High temperatures, fever in other words, that's very interesting with regard to COVID-19. Now I'd like to talk about the systemic effects of vitamin C. There are hundreds or even thousands of studies on vitamin C. Only few other substances have been studied as well as vitamin C. What we see here is that vitamin C helps to fight cancer and improves the quality of life in general. As a result of this, more and more people, including myself, take vitamin C on a regular basis. I have a vitamin C infusion once a week to give me more power. It's a healthy, natural way of boosting my own well-being, much better than any other product containing sugar or caffeine or indeed nicotine. 
So it's an ideal way of strengthening your own well-being. It has a very positive effect on our bones. Vitamin C activates osteoblasts and inhibits osteoclasts. It improves bone mineralization and we clearly see that after implantation and bone augmentation measures, vitamin C helps to strengthen the bone growth quickly and we have very good long-term prospects. We also said before that vitamin C helps to improve the periodontal situation. We said that periodontitis is clearly the result of a D3 and vitamin C deficiency. So taking vitamin C helps to improve the periodontal situation. Let's now look at vitamin C and corona, the connection there. Various studies illustrate that, that the symptoms of flu-like symptoms reduced by 85% after a high doses of vitamin C, that's six, six grams, which I personally would not consider to be a high dose, but still supplementing vitamin C seems to be in a position to prevent respiratory tract diseases. Let's turn to one of the most renowned experts in the field, Professor Cheng. We interviewed him pretty much right after the pandemic broke out. Professor Chang lives in the United States and in Shanghai. He's one of the foremost experts on vitamin C. And in Shanghai, he treated COVID-19 patients very successfully with high dosage um, vitamin C application. He has a study similar to our study on vitamin D3. He has his own study on vitamin C and he asks everyone taking vitamin C on a regular basis to enroll and provide the data and support his study. Actually, in autumn, he will be with us here in Kreuzlingen at the Swiss BioHealth Days. Here's the QR code for you to scan and have access to the re relevant study. He would greatly appreciate your help and we would all appreciate your help. Let's take a look at the studies that I mentioned earlier. I'd like to highlight two of them. Here we have a study with 47 students and flu-like symptoms who were given the same therapy as the control group, 3 grams per day, but only as of day 2. What they didn't get was um, analgesics and decongestants, but they got a high dose of vitamin C, 6 grams, on day 1. That's the only difference between the two groups, 1 gram per hour, no analgesics, no decongestants. And the result was that the flu-like symptoms were reduced by 85% compared to the control group. So the only difference here is a high-dose vitamin C application on day one, 6 grams. This already reduces flu-like symptoms by 85%. So it makes perfect sense to have vitamin C ready in case of uh, flu. This study here was carried out with soldiers of the Korean army. The test group received six grams of vitamin C over a longer period of time per day and roughly 800 soldiers received placebo. Of course the test subjects didn't know which group they belonged to and it clearly emerged that the vitamin C group showed a 20% lower risk of catching a cold. This was a very clear result, a very interesting result. Now, you might have thought that 20% isn't that much, but probably the reason is that the placebo groups benefited from the very placebo effect. Um, they thought they had received vitamin C and responded to that. But it's a randomized uh, control trial. And with 20%, I think it's fair to say that we have a clearly significant result. Here is Professor Cheng's study published on the 18th of March 2020. Successful high-dose vitamin C treatment of patients with serious and critical COVID-19 infection. In our interview, he explained in a very interesting fashion what he did, how he was able to help those patients. And since then... American hospitals have started treating coronavirus patients with vitamin C in March and many other hospitals have followed um, this advice. 
Now, his colleague, Dr. Enjin Mao, also treated 360 COVID-19 patients, moderate to severe COVID-19 cases. They were given vitamin C infusions 10 to 20 grams a day, 7 to 10 days, and all patients improved. There were no um, fatalities. Nobody died in this group, despite the fact that most of them were moderate to severe cases. They were able to leave the hospital three to five days earlier, which is highly relevant. A government decides to have a lockdown in order to ensure that hospital capacity would not be used beyond a critical point. If I have a simple substance such as vitamin C, which helps to shorten hospital stays by three or even five days, this is extremely valuable, which means that 25% or 30% of patients more will be possible, which will lead to much faster herd immunity. And we've got to say it very clearly, the more lockdown we have, the more we isolate people, the longer it will take for herd immunity to materialize. Sweden, for example, has a very high herd immunity now already. For Sweden, the issue is almost over and dealt with. They did have slightly higher fatalities, But basically, COVID-19 is almost over in Sweden because Sweden now has herd immunity. Conversely, here we will see more fatalities over the next few months because according to Professor Strig, we are at a herd immunity which is at higher level than officially claimed, but still not where Sweden is as we were able to see in a very impressive fashion. It has worked in Sweden and it will certainly become more obvious by the day that Sweden has chosen a better option than many other countries. There was one case where the patient deteriorated in Dr. Mao's study and in his desperation, in inverted commas, he gave 50 grams of vitamin C over four hours This is a very high level, but I personally also take 50 grams occasionally. I don't recommend it to anyone who doesn't tolerate vitamin C very well. But I take 50 grams within two hours. And in this case, they were able to see in real time how the lung status of this patient stabilized. And they were able to observe how the patient recovered um, very quickly and there was no simple um, death in this group. This was really interesting so there are ways of helping patients um, with severe symptoms. Here's yet another study which was only just published. It's a meta-analysis. So various other studies were taken together and analyzed and this meta-study was able to show that average hospital stay stay in an intensive care unit was down by 18 percent the period of time required for mechanical ventilation down by 20 percent and the damage to the lung tissue was clearly down as well vitamin c as a radical catcher reduces oxidative stress consequently damage to the lung tissue was clearly reduced This brings us to the end of the Fantastic Four, but let's go further, which is why I've decided to extend the principle a little bit. I now call it the Fantastic Four and more. How can we strengthen our immune system in times of COVID-19? And our interview partners, excellent um, people, top experts in their respective fields, they were all asked what else they do, how else they protect their families, their friends, their patients. And we were able to draw a very clear picture of the additional measures that all these experts um, uh, take. With almost no exception, they all take vitamin C on a daily basis, up to 10 grams per day, every few hours. You can actually um, raise the doses, the dose on a regular basis. If you tolerate it well, you can go on and increase the dose if you don't develop diarrhea. Everyone, without any exception, takes vitamin D3, 5,000 to 15,000 units per day. 
They also said that you need to strive for 60 to 100 nanograms per milliliter. In our study, we're suggesting 40 to 80 nanograms, but in times of corona, it definitely makes sense to go for 60 to 100 nanograms. They all take vitamin K2 very much um, along the lines of international recommendations, 100 to 200 micrograms per day. All take all of them take magnesium women should have 300 milligrams on an elementary level but we don't actually take it as elementary magnesium because our body cannot process it we always uh, take it as magnesium citrate and with men it's slightly more um, the recommendation is one to two grams of magnesium citrate per day And here comes the more. This is why it's fantastic for and more, because what comes next is a substance that almost everyone is taking as well, significant amounts of um, coenzyme Q10, omega-3, and various vitamin B vitamins, B2, B6, B12, and the relevant uh, doses here, just to help you um, find your way a little bit. Let's take a closer look at what these additional substances do, these cofactors. Coenzyme Q10 is also called ubiquinone, which is a substance that our body produces and stores. But the older we grow, the less our body is able to produce Q10. So it's very important in terms of anti-aging to take 40, 50, at 40, 50, 60 years of age to take more and more coenzyme Q10 as a supplement. Q10 is very important for mitochondrial function because energy supply is supported and at the end of the day it's all down to energy for our cells, for our immune system, for our metabolism. And Q10 helps protect against oxidative stress, bacteria and viruses. Q10 is also important with regard to energy supply and the production of ATP. ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is the energy carrier transporting electrons in our system, regulating our blood pressure. It also represents a catalyst for vitamin E and vitamin C. We've already talked about vitamin C. We'll come back to vitamin E later. We can also find the highest concentration in those um, organs that require the highest level of energy. That's the heart, the kidney, the lung and the liver. Q10 also protects against um, skin aging and reduces the risk of developing skin cancer. So this is very important because the older you are, the more you should take uh, coenzyme 10, Q10. It reduces headache, strengthens your mental capacity. It helps with fatigue and stabilizes blood glucose levels. So Q10 has very valuable qualities indeed. Let's move on to the next substance, omega-3. Almost all colleagues are taking omega-3 an essential fatty acid. Let's take a look at the different types of fatty acids we have. It's just a quick overview. We won't talk about the details, but it's always important to quickly um, list the different types we have. We've got trans fats. That's the very bad fats. We've got to um, avoid them like the plague. Um, trans fats are contained in fast food, hamburgers, um, processed food, but also deep fried food, crisps, french fries, etc. It's definitely bad for our system. It's definitely harmful to our health. Then we have saturated fatty acids. Saturated means they have no double bond between C atoms to be found in milk, cheese, sausages and meat products. They're not bad per se, but we've got to reduce them as much as we can in our diet. What we need is unsaturated fatty acid with at least one double bond 
we can find them with uh, different uh, nuts, seeds and plant oils, avocado for example. And in this group we also have polyunsaturated fatty acids. They are also known as essential fatty acids because our body cannot produce them. We need to take them from outside. Now omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids belong to this category. Now you wonder why do we keep talking about omega-3 supplementation and not about omega-6 supplementation? Well the answer is fairly simple. In our diet there is too much omega-6. And the balance between omega-3 and omega-6 is not very favorable in the way we feed ourselves. These two fatty acids regulate our inflammatory response. Now, an inflammation is nothing bad per se. Inflammations help repair um, the body. There are good inflammations and bad inflammations, but we need inflammations to regenerate tissue. Omega-6 and omega-3 regulate the inflammatory response. Omega-6 is a bit like the accelerator pedal in the car, and omega-3 is the brake pedal. To put it uh, in simple terms, in the past, the balance was like this, 2.5 to 1. Uh, perhaps it was even 1 to 1 many, many years ago. And we, are, we were in a position where we were neutral. The accelerator pedal and the brake pedal basically controlled the inflammatory response very well. Now today, in Europe, the ratio has changed to 15 to 1. Omega-6, 15, and Omega-3, 1. Which means that we have more chronic stress. Chronic stress means premature aging, and the risk, increased risk of developing chronic diseases and cancer. A higher risk for a cytokine storm in case of COVID-19 with potentially fatal outcome. A few hundred years ago, we were at 1.5 to 1, perhaps at 1 to 1, what is interesting is that the farm animals that we slaughter and eat today are mainly fed with a cereal diet, which basically means that over the past decades and centuries, the omega-6 share in their diet was clearly increased. So the meat we eat today contains a much higher level of omega-6 fatty acids. As a result, the ratio has deteriorated substantially to the detriment of omega-3. When we eat game, we've got to be aware that game animals are from the wild. They eat herbs and as a result, they can, their meat contains a much higher level of omega-3. So game meat is clearly healthier. Omega-3 products derived from plants contain high levels of alpha-linoleic acid, which the body um, needs to convert to EPA and DHA, which we need. That's important to know when buying a supplement, you will always see the DHA share and the conversion factor becomes lower the more omega-6 we have in our food. So the question is, where can we get omega-3-4 if we don't supplement it um, with a high EPA and DHA content? We can get it from fish. We could also get it from linseed oil. But it's equally important to check how much omega-6 you have in your diet. Because the more omega-6 you have in your diet... Uh, the lower the DHA conversion rate on the level of omega-3 if omega-3 is of plant origin. Omega-6 is to be found in soy, sunflower oil and um, corn germ oil. How do we feed our animals, the cows that we eat? They are fed soy products, they're also fed corn products or maize products, so they um, their meat has a high level of omega-6 and that's the disadvantage if we eat such products. We just get much more omega-6, deteriorating the ratio even more. 
omega-3 can be found in linseed oil, hemp seed oil, walnut oil as well. That's fantastic. It looks like uh, there is a much higher content compared to salmon or mackerel. That's not quite true. Mackerel contains a high level of DHA, which with um, linseed oil has to be converted first of all. So you can't say that linseed oil gives us much more um, omega-3 than fish, for example. So we've got to bear this factor into an account. Omega-3 definitely was an important factor when human beings reached the seas and had more access to omega-3. We see here very clearly with EPA and DHA, these two substances bring down blood fat and um, have a positive impact on um, inflama inflammatory mediators and blood pressure they, they reduce inflammation and support health in general health of our eyes of our brain they reduce the attention deficit order with children and in general have many more positive effects on our health now here's a quick spotlight on the study I mentioned before, omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acid ratio. At some point in our history we had a ratio of 1 to 1 omega-6 to omega-3 and today we are at 15 or 17 to 1 which is of course a complete disaster. We can also see the result here. As a result of this ratio Various chronic diseases such as cardiovascular disease, cancer, chronic inflammations, but also autoimmune diseases are much more severe. Even if we just have a ratio of 4 to 1, which is still far from ideal, we should have 2.5 to 1. At 4 to 1, we still have a 70% decrease in total mortality. So mortality down by 70% at a ratio of 4 to 1, omega-6 to omega-3. So we need to attack um, at two fronts, reduce omega-6, increase omega-3 in order to strengthen our health. And again, we come out of the pro-inflammatory state. And this is an excellent prevention of viral diseases. So omega-3 helps us very much here. What effect does omega-3 deficiency have? Here we have the various symptoms that occur in omega-3 deficiency. These are very serious conditions here. And the older we grow, the more we develop such symptoms. The older we grow, the more we need to supplement omega-3. Let's now talk about the three B vitamins, B2, B6 and B12. B2 influences our metabolism, particularly with regard to obtaining energy from um, glucose and fat. We need riboflavin, that's B2. Deficiency causes um, growth disorders, skin diseases, particularly also affects mucous membranes if you have um, lacerated angles of the mouth, angular chylosis, that's a clear sign of deficient B2. Then we look at B6, and co is a coenzyme for a metabolism of amino acids. It has in, an influence generally on the formation and conversion of proteins. It has an impact on um, growth and development. A deficiency leads to acne, um, angular chylosis again, and painful periods with women. Vitamin B12, this is um, a substance we add to all of our infusions. It's very good for our metabolism and our nervous system. It helps a blood formation, detoxification, but also decomposition of fatty acids. And it basically supports emotional and physical fitness. A deficiency of B12 causes chronic fatigue, chronic exhaustion, but other symptoms with the nervous system, partial paralysis, deafness, difficulty to concentrate, weak muscles and um, shrinking of muscles. 
We're still back to the list. There are some bullet points missing, but we'll be through with them in a short time. All colleagues also took zinc citrate and vitamin E and vitamin A. You can see the amounts there in brackets. This is pretty much the composition of the basic immune or daily use product we have been um, offering for many, many years, and which we developed for patients to take preoperatively and postoperatively. And what is interesting is that the mixture we developed to boost the immune system and to avoid complications after surgical intervention at all costs to make sure everything runs smoothly, that we have good healing, no infections. This mixture is pretty much exactly what world-renowned experts are using, whether it's uh, Professor Klingha, Professor Cheng, Professor Hollig or Professor Levy. They all use exactly, exactly this mixture that I'm presenting here. Let's take a closer look at it. What does zinc do? We all know if we have um, grooves or lines in our fingernails, that's a clear sign of zinc deficiency. Skin, nails and hair, that's what zinc supports. It supports the metabolism at large. It's very good for our immune system, particularly in times of cold. It also helps with diabetes and allergies. A zinc deficiency causes exhaustion, fatigue, skin conditions, also disposition to cold and infections, particularly herpes. Always think of a zinc deficiency if you develop herpes, but also allergies and difficulties to concentrate. Vitamin A is next. We all know that we can get vitamin A from carrots. But vitamin A should always be taken together with oil. If we have a freshly squeezed carrot juice, add a bit of oil because vitamin A is a fat-soluble vitamin. The principle is EDKA. Vitamins EDKA, that's the fat-soluble vitamins that you should not overdose whereas water-soluble vitamins are all excreted automatically when they are overdosed. So vitamin A has an impact on our visual capacity, but it also affects our growth, the function and composition of skin and mucous membranes and our metabolism. A vitamin A deficiency can cause blindness even, so we always have to ensure we take vitamin A because it has an effect on the cornea. Dry eyes, itchy eyes or loss of hair. Those could be early signs of vitamin A deficiency. But if you suffer from dry mucous membranes, generally you may be suffering from a vitamin A deficiency. We know that dry mucous membranes are a risk for catching diseases so we've got to keep our mucous membranes soft and wet this is actually the reason why our nose starts to run when we catch a cold to keep our mucous membranes wet and flush out the viruses in order for them not to be able to settle vitamin e is a very strong antioxidant Similar to vitamin C, it helps prevent oxidative stress and the result of a deficiency is anemia, tiredness, wrinkled skin, etc. So we've taken another big step. Some colleagues take vitamin C infusions on a weekly basis during the corona pandemic. We also introduced this with our team at least as long as we were not affected by the lockdown, all our team members were given a 15 gram vitamin C dose every week and they can still have it if they want to. What I can also mention here is a UV blood irradiation therapy with ozone. Blood is taken out of the um, bloodstream, pumped to a device which um, exposes the blood to ozone the blood then runs through another device which irradiates the blood with UV light before the blood is pumped back into our veins. 
This is a very efficacious, simple therapy, and it's extremely effective. All we're using here is ozone. Ozone is O3. It's basically oxygen plus one oxygen radical. This is O3, ozone, and it's so effective that it is actually banned by anti-doping regulations. So top athletes are not allowed to use this method with regard to competitions. Why is it so effective against coronavirus? Here's a study issued in 2019. What we can see here is that coronaviruses have these spikes here. It's a bit like suction cups, if you want. They have cysteine there in these suction cups, and this cysteine is required to bind to the membranes of our cells or the host cells. According to most scientists, viruses are not living organisms themselves. They're just DNA plus a protein shell. They cannot replicate, reproduce by themselves. There's no sexual procreation. Viruses need a host, a human cell, for example. It could also be an animal cell, obviously. And they use our replication mechanism to replicate themselves. So this is the reason why viruses continue to mutate, because they have no other way of developing otherwise and keep themselves alive. Unlike with the human beings with sexual reproduction, where we have a pool of genes triggering changes in the DNA, it's only normal for viruses to mutate. It's not bad. We couldn't live without viruses. The question just is, which viruses are we talking about and how does our immune system handle those viruses? But in order for viruses to be able to replicate, they need to merge with the cell membrane of our cells, of the host cells, to enter the whole cells. And they need cysteine at these suction cups. And this is precisely what ozone therapy um, attacks, it inactivates the cysteine. It's a very cost efficient, low risk therapy that could be considered almost a natural antibiotic against coronavirus. But it's also very positive when used preventively uh, to uh, protect against virus disease, viral diseases. What else can be done? In the first part of the longevity code, I discussed the Wim Hof breathing method a hyperventilation method which comes at no cost. It makes you basic immediately. You can check that with a pH test strip you can get from a pharmacy. Test your urine, test your saliva. You get basic very quickly as a result of applying this method. And scientific studies, a large number of scientific studies, were able to show that test persons and control groups exposed to Wim Hof breathing therapy and inoculated with Escherichia coli, um, the uh, test group did not um, respond to Escherichia coli. It's a very interesting method. You can take a look at the first part where I describe the study and the method at length. If you catch the disease, what can be done? What kind of treatment is recommendable, according to our colleagues? Well, they administer 20 to 25 grams of vitamin C every six hours. That's a high dose uh, administration plus magnesium sulfate, eight millimol. And in case of severe symptoms, we can go up to 50 grams. This is what we used to do eight or nine years ago. We developed this as a standard protocol uh, during surgery. In the meantime, we have switched to three applications of 15 grams over three days, up to 120 grams for cancer patients. Another very effective method to uh, treat um, COVID-19 is an 80-year-old substance, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. There's a great study on this, which is a very recent one. If we succeed in disturbing glycolization of ACE, that's the angiotensin-converting enzyme 2, 
if we succeed in disturbing this process, the virus no longer um, has a possibility to bind to the receptor. It's very similar to vitamin D3 in this respect. So this approach inhibits the attachment of the virus to the host cells and it also works on the pH value. In the cell the pH value is increased and as a result the virus can no longer merge or enter the host cell. Here's a beautiful study from France which was able to show that we had 100% healing with patients treated with a combination of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. The group treated only with hydroxychloroquine showed a healing rate of almost 60%. The control group had a healing rate of 12.5%. So here again we have a very effective approach, a very um, effective treatment protocol which is safe and doesn't cost much. We are in uh, contact with quite a number of patients suffering from COVID-19. What is interesting is that all of these people had a very low vitamin D3 value, generally below 10 nanograms, but they all recovered very well as a result of this treatment protocol. And they've all become healthy again. So what else can we do? Hyperthermal contrast baths, according to Bircher Benner. I'm sure you all know Bircher Muesli. Professor Bircher treated a large number of patients during the Spanish flu, 1916 to 1918, where almost a million people died. He treated soldiers at his clinic and his survival rate was 100%. In addition to giving them raw food and some other organic measures, he um, applied hypothermal, hypothermal contrast baths with the soldiers. You can do that as well at home if you want. If you feel that you're catching a cold, you will feel your muscles or your joints aching, um, fill your bathtub, not too hot, get into the bathtub. Of course, you have to have um, stable circulation, a strong heart, and then you um, add heat to the water up to 42 degrees centigrade. Stay in the water for 15 minutes, get out, go to bed, don't dry your skin, go to bed wet, wrap yourself up in towels and sweat for another hour. Support this by taking lime blossom tea, add honey and lemon. And if you combine this with the Wim Hof breathing method, you will be back on track within a short period of time. So this is what Becher Benner applied, hyperthermal contrast baths. Other recommendations uh, include oxygen and injections of heparin. What is very important is to bear in mind that we're talking about an infection of the respiratory tract. COVID-19 patients sometimes develop pneumonia, so we've got to make sure we protect our respiratory tract. In general, but particularly in times of coronavirus, if you're a member of a risk group, do not smoke. This is probably one reason why Italy was so badly affected and the levels were slightly elevated in Switzerland as well and other countries where smoking is still quite widespread. Try to get as much fresh air as possible. Keep your respiratory tract warm. During the cold season, wrap a scarf around your neck and keep the mucous membranes wet. What we heard from Dr. Levy and what I also applied every day for a couple of minutes at least is this device here you can buy for just a few euros. It's a nebulizer. You can get it from a pharmacy. You can buy hydrogen peroxide, 3%. If that's too strong for you, you can dilute it with tap water. You can also buy lower um, concentrations and then inhale for a few minutes every day because hydrogen peroxide is extremely virostatic and kills the viruses that have settled on your mucous membranes. And last but not least, which is very important, is sleep. Sleep is one of the best remedies in addition to fever. And it's absolutely vital in case of a viral disease. Never take 
any drugs to treat fever or antipyretics, that's completely the wrong approach, provided your overall health is good. What you should be doing is not to take the fever down by taking synthetic drugs. Our mothers used to apply um, fever compresses, leg compresses in order to take the fever down, but a temperature of 40, 40 and a half, 41 degrees is very important to boost our immune system, to kill the viruses. Don't try and take the fever down unless you need to because of general health reasons. And the second member of the top household remedies or natural remedies, which even our grandmothers used to apply, is sleep. Sleep, sleep and sleep again. If we are ill, we don't want to eat. Take a look at a dog, for example. If the dog is ill, um, it doesn't eat anymore. It just sleeps for the rest of the day. So limit the amount of food you take and try and get as much sleep as possible because during sleep, human growth hormones are formed, stem cells are produced, but the telomeres get repaired as well. And in general, regeneration and muscle growth is stimulated. So sleep is a very important remedy because this is what we need to focus on. We need to focus on sleep which is rich in deep sleep phases. This was a point I made in the last edition of the Longevity Code. Right, ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of the third part of the Longevity Code. Our next editions will cover the following topics, sports and exercise and performance, a very important aspect, a very important topic. If we are in very good physical shape, it doesn't really matter what profession we have, whether we are in a surgery for eight hours or whether we work at our computers, screens for six hours. Whatever we do, whatever we practice, the better our physical health, the better our basic fitness, the less energy we require, the better we can show endurance. And if we have a back pain after three hours in the operating theatre, we've got to work on our physical fitness. I'll also be talking about hormones and neurotransmitters. And that's a very important topic. I'll also talk about a natural way of um, producing endorphins, which is called low-dose naltrexone therapy. I will also be covering the emotional level. I'll talk about the human needs psychology by Anthony Robbins. It's a very simple model, which I have been um, familiar with for 25 years. This is a model which helps explain every single way human beings behave. Every behavioral pattern follows this structure, this principle of human needs psychology and you will very easily see it's always the same patterns repeating themselves. It also helps to anticipate the way humans behave and consequently also positively control the way I behave. It's also about breaking patterns. We all live according to patterns. That's our autopilot uh, which uh, comes on time and time again and framing is an equally important aspect when working with patients. In terms of effectiveness we'll be talking about the disease to please, in other words not being able to say no. Uh, we also need to think in terms of solutions rather than problems and class 1 to class 4 activities. What we sh need to do is to be in class 1 all the time Important and not urgent. This is what we should be dealing with. The worst class is class four. Not important, not urgent. For example, watching the news of uh, broadcasting stations or use your time to spend um, on whatever you have, Instagram, Facebook, etc. It's just a waste of time, really. That's class four activity. It's not important and not urgent. What is important and not urgent? Everything to do with our health, our relationships, our children, our partners. And I'll also be talking about other ways of managing our time. It's going to be very interesting, I promise. 
I've invested a great deal of time and effort in this two-day seminar, which used to last one day. And I'll still have to put some more work into these topics, and they will be ready probably just before the next seminar, which will take place on the 17th and 18th of September 2020. That's two days here at the Swiss Biohealth Education Center. And it's open to dentists, um, doctors, other healthcare professionals, and generally everyone interested in health, even without uh, a medical profession. And here's my last slide. It's a call to attend the Swiss Biohealth Days. They will be following on to the interviews with fantastic people we've been featuring in our interview series, prominent experts from their respective fields. And I kept asking them during the interviews whether they'd be ready to come to Kreuzlingen to attend our Congress. And almost everyone said yes. The only person missing here is Professor Hollick here, but we'll get him as well, I promise. So we will have a fantastic weekend with thrilling experts. It's been very difficult over the last few months uh, during COVID uh, to actually settle for a date, but we did want to settle a date. Nobody actually said, uh, you can do it here at the Swift Biohealth Education Center. We are limited in terms of capacity here so first come, first served, that's the rule. And if we have a large number of um, applications, we'll have to expand the auditorium here a little bit, take out one wall perhaps. And if we get still more, we will try and make sure we have a solution with um, intelligent camera systems to um, broadcast to a different hall, perhaps uh, in the lobby there. So here at the Education Center, this is where the Swiss Biohealth Days will take place. It's going to be a very interesting weekend. Lai Ribeiro is not here on the list, but I'm sure we'll get him as well. We'll have uh, some of the most renowned experts from around the world. Right, this brings me to the end of the third part with the announcement of the Swiss Biohealth Days. I hope you enjoyed the third part of the Longevity Code as well. And if you're interested in hearing more about the other topics, um, we're very much looking forward to welcoming you here uh, at our two-day seminar in September. Thank you very much for watching. Do have a very good time, stay healthy and see you soon.